Well, folks, I was going to put this out last week, and man, am I glad I didn't on Friday. <laughs> what a weekend we're having in the aviation world, ladies and gentlemen. Can you believe all of this? Welcome to another episode of the Lessons from the Cockpit Show. I am your host, Mark Hacera, and for over 60 years, aviation has been my passion. I love all things about aviation. And folks, this week, we've had a great week for aviation with this balloon and now these other objects. On the Lessons from the Cockpit Show, we hear from the most fascinating and intriguing pilots, aircrew members, maintainers, and aviation enthusiasts from all over the world. Our purpose here is to hear their stories, but more importantly, what did they learn from these extraordinary and extreme commercial, military, and even private flying events in their lives? By doing this, we get a better understanding of how does the aviation world work and increase critical thinking skills both in the air and on the ground. And today we're going to have some really cool stuff because some guy actually recorded 24 minutes of the intercept. You can hear everything that's going on. The Lessons from the Cockpit Show is financed and supported by Wall Pilot, aviation art for the walls of your home office or hangar. There's 127 ready to print, four foot, six foot, or eight foot vinyl prints that you can peel off and stick to any flat surface. We also do unit patches and we do custom work. If there's an airplane that you love that you want to have your name on from a particular unit with a particular tail number and tail code, even a custom weapons load, we can do that for you at wallpilot.com. So go to wallpilot.com and see some of these things because folks, these are really, really detailed profiles. I actually have a Russian aeronautical engineer that was in the Russian Air Force that draws some of these things for me. They're really detailed drawings, folks. Please help support the podcast and go to wallpilot.com and buy one or two of these really detailed vinyl aviation prints for the walls of your home office or hangar. As I said, this is an aviation week like we've had no other, you know, shooting down Chinese balloons and these objects, whatever they might be, throughout uh, the United States and Canada. So grab an adult beverage of your choice, sit down, strap in. And let's talk about the Chinese balloon shoot down and listen to some of the actual audio of the people that were involved. Part of me doesn't even know where to start with all of this. As I sit here and think about all of the things that could have gone on during this whole event that you realize only lasted about a week and all of the media hoopla, everything. I think what I want to do here is answer some of the questions that I have in these conversations with many of my friends who are not in the military and don't understand a lot of these military things that they were hearing on the news. The first question I want to talk about is why? Why did they do this? Why do they continue to send these balloons over other countries also? And of course, part of that is their intentions. What were they intending on doing by floating this balloon across the United States? The very first state it went over, obviously, is Alaska. Why did they shoot it down over Alaska? Because Elmendorf Air Force Base and the third fighter wing has a squadron of F-22s. And I want to talk a little bit about the F-22 and some of the technology that that airplane has, because that airplane truly is the beast. If you want to talk about a fighter plane that is in a class all of its own, it's the F-22. And I'm going to give you two stories from its historical engagements that will help you understand why you would want to choose this particular air. A number of people have asked me, hey, Mark, why did they use an infrared missile? a heat-seeking missile. And I want to tell you a little bit about that particular missile because, believe it or not, I was a project manager for the operational testing and evaluation for AIM-9X, both the Block 1 missiles and the Block 2 missiles. So I have some things to tell you about that particular missile, and it is a fantastic missile for a whole host of reasons. Another question I've been asked is, what's this balloon carrying? What's this package that it has? And I went and 
did some research and I found some pretty scary things about this balloon package and its payload that as soon as I read particularly one article, the hair stood up on the back of my neck. And then the last question I'm going to talk about is what did we learn from this? What did we do to it? And what did we learn from this event as this balloon kept going across the United States doing whatever it was designed to do? And folks, there's some really cool history behind the call signs of the two F-22s that I want to talk about. And I just want to give you a better understanding of how the aviation world works, particularly from the standpoint of going up and intercepting something that's going across your nation. Now, all of you know that I'm a KC-135 guy, but I've been involved numerous, numerous exercises that showed how to do this. And a matter of fact, one exercise I made for the wing that really helps understand how and why this happened. All of the pieces of the puzzle that have to work together when you're doing something like this is pretty amazing. The dedication and the professionalism of the military guys and gals that were involved in this is truly remarkable. And thank heavens, folks, we have men and women in the military volunteer to do this kind of stuff and are really, really good at it. I think one of the first things we need to do is go back to 1999 and a white paper that was written by two Chinese colonels as they were going through their version of Air War College. The white paper that they wrote was called Unrestricted Warfare and spoke about how do you accomplish warfare in the age of globalization. And the basic premise of their white paper was there are no rules. Nothing is forbidden anymore when it comes to warfare in the age of globalization, particularly if you are taking on a superior force, a superpower like the United States. And I'll tell you, these concepts are about a decade and a half before their time. These two colonels were really good at looking into the future. Cao Liang and Wang Zhangsui, I am not a Chinese linguist, so I probably murdered their names, wrote this unrestricted warfare volume. And here's kind of a synopsis of what it says. And this was written by the Task and Purpose guys back in 2016. And here's what they said. Colonels Quang Liang and Wang Zhangsui argued that war was no longer about using armed forces to compel the enemy to submit to one's will. In the classic Clausewitz and sense. Rather, they asserted that war had evolved to using all means, including armed forces or non-armed forces, military and non-military, and lethal and non-lethal means to compel the enemy to accept one's interest. The barrier between soldier and civilians would fundamentally be erased because the battle would be everywhere. The number of new battlefields would be virtually infinite and could include environmental war warfare, financial warfare, trade warfare, cultural warfare, legal warfare, just to name a few. There are actually 15 modalities of war that they postulated, and I'll talk about those in just a second. They wrote of assassinating financial speculators to safeguard a nation's financial security, setting up slush funds to influence opponents' legislatures and governments, and buying controlling shares of stock to convert any adversary's major television and newspaper outlets into tools of media warfare. According to the editor's note, Quang argued in a subsequent interview that the first rule of unrestricted warfare is that there are no rules with nothing forbidden. That vision clearly transcends any traditional notions of warfare. Now, I find all of that very fascinating because when you look at the 15 modalities of warfare, here's what those are. They include cultural warfare, economic warfare, environmental Environmental warfare, financial warfare, illegal drug warfare, international law warfare, information and media warfare, telecommunications and network warfare, political warfare, psychological warfare, resource warfare, smuggling, technology, terrorists, and even gang warfare. These are the 15 modalities of warfare that these two Chinese colonels postulated in the book on unrestricted warfare. I bring all of this up because I want you to think in these kinds of terms when we're talking about the Chinese. This white paper became their 
Bible for warfare against any superior, technologically advanced enemy like the United States. And aren't we seeing all of these things now? And every one of these 15 modalities of war, you can look in the national news, international news, and see every stinking one of them. So now let's turn to the first question. Why? Why would you use a balloon with a payload underneath it? And the Chinese were actually very smart when they did this. Glenn Van Erk, General Glenn Van Erk, call sign Fats. I knew Fats when he was a captain in the Vampires, the 44th Fighter Squadron in Okinawa, Japan in the 18th Wing. He is now the NORAD commander and gave testimony on the 6th of February as to this balloon. He was asked, well, how big was this thing? And he said, the balloon itself was over 200 feet tall and the payload that it was carrying was about the size of an airliner about ERJ size so like a regional jet airliner size weighed a couple thousand pounds that's pretty good size if you think about it an uh, airliner that holds about 65 people that's a good size uh, piece of metal that you're looking at at the bottom of this helium balloon mylar balloon now when I was exploring the jet stream where this balloon was launched into, I found out that at 60 to 70,000 feet, the jet stream may reach speeds of 250 to 275 miles an hour, which is moving pretty fast for something that is that big and doesn't have a lot of propulsion on it. I feel that the Chinese were very smart in choosing this type of method to cross the United States because one other thing it gives them is a story. They can always say, well, it was a weather balloon, which of course they have, you know, and they're all mad and pissed off about us going up and shooting down one of their weather balloons. Whenever you do operations like this, you always have to have some type of tactical deception information warfare story that you can say, oh, it's just one of our weather balloons. Leave it alone. Let it do whatever it needs to do. You know, it just got off course. And that's the story we've been told with this balloon. So I think the Chinese were very smart in choosing this method to put a payload, whatever kind of payload it is, above the United States. If you're going to task a balloon and a reconnaissance payload like this, then obviously you have some type of in intentions and purpose. If you feel that your adversary is not going to mess with the balloon and its payload, then you can probably collect some really good intelligence on its path, knowing what the jet stream is going to do and where the jet stream is going to take this balloon. And one thing that I learned from being in a lot of intelligence classes while I was in the military is your intelligence operations are trying to answer some questions. Your intelligence operations are trying to remove some kind of uncertainty that you have in your mind as to their tactics, techniques, and procedures or their capabilities. Finding those answers is critical to the things that you are doing, particularly to the war plans you are preparing or operations that you are preparing for. And we even had a category for these things. And I think, if I remember right, we called them critical intelligence requirements. And before we went into Afghanistan, before we went into Iraq, we had CIRs that we needed to know so that we went into the war plan with a greater amount of certainty. And that's a concept I'm going to introduce you to here real quick. There was another gentleman who wrote a book on warfare in the 21st century, and he had a discussion on what he called the elements of a decision maker's dilemma. And there were four of them. Those four are risk, time, quality of knowledge, and outcomes. If you can gain valuable intelligence knowledge, you can reduce risk and second and third order effects because you act 
with more certainty of your outcomes. And this is what Intelligence Collection is really trying to do for commanders. Reduce risk and increase certainty so that when it comes time to go to war or to go against an adversary, you know how they're going to react, how they're going to act, who they're talking to, how they're talking to them. And you may even have really good pictures of the facilities they're talking from to whatever it might be. Let me give you two examples of this. Both of them are from the Operation Iraqi Freedom in the 2003 Shock and Awe campaign. The first one, we didn't have really good pictures of a lot of the targets that we were going to strike in Iraq. A lot of the target folders had old, outdated pictures in them that were up to a decade old. So one very enterprising Brigadier General in the CAOC came up with this concept that he called non-traditional intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, or non-traditional ISR. We had a lot of airplanes that were flying with really, really spectacular targeting pods throughout Iraq during the Operation Southern Watch no-fly zone operations. They... The F-16s from some of these Guard and Reserve F-16 units that were deployed to Prince Sultan Air Base were carrying the brand new Lightning Pod, which had the capability of data linking the pictures that it was seeing back, these infrared pictures. And these were really, really good pictures in the infrared spectrum. A lot of these Guard and Reserve F-16 pilots were being told, okay, we need you to go here and turn your pod on. And they're like, wait, what? And we had to tell them why. And once they understood why, then they were all over it. And they would go out there and being typical fighter pilots, knowing, okay, if I was going to strike this target, what would I want to see? How would I want to see it? And what kind of video would I need to help me discern where I want to put my bombs? And it was spectacularly successful really successful. And I think the Brigadier General's name, he became the director of the CAOC. I believe it was Kanga, Kanga Roo. He was or had been the wing commander at Shaw Air Force Base. And right before the war started, he became the director of the CAOC. And I believe he was the one who instituted this non-traditional ISR using fighter jets with this new lightning targeting pod on the uh, intake lip of the F-16s. Another great intelligence tool that we used was called intrusive intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance or intrusive ISR. And here's an example of intrusive ISR. A lot of fighter planes would just charge right at the Iraqi no-fly zone northern line. And so their radar operators would see all of these fighters turning toward them as if, okay, here we come. And we would actually map who the radar operators were talking to, who they were talking to in the sector operations centers, what they were doing when with that information. And and we also had other airplanes like the rivet joint, the RC-135, the compass call, all of them were collecting on the radars and the data links and who was talking to who and how so that we had a really good idea of where the decision makers were, what those decision makers were seeing and the information that they were getting into the sector operations centers. Now, obviously the sector operations centers are like target number one because the air defense commanders are normally located in these underground or concrete bunkers and the F-117s were tasked to take these things out. But this intrusive ISR that we did actually gave us an opportunity to see how the Iraqi air defense system worked. One other really fascinating thing about intrusive ISR was we could interject things into the Iraqi system, the air defense system. And we did this through a number of airplanes and it was like in the movie Independence Day where they give the uh, alien vehicle a virus. We were kind of doing the same 
same thing. And at the same time, we're collecting through the rivet joint and other electronic intelligence collection aircraft, what's going on with that virus banging around inside their system. Now, folks, if you want to read about this network attack, senior suitor, some other names that I can't remember off the top of my head, go back and read all the articles on Operation Outside the Box, where the Israeli Air Force went into Syria. The North Koreans were helping the Syrians build a nuclear reactor. On the night of the 6th of September of 2007, the Israeli Air Force with F-16 Sufas, F-15 Rams, F-15Es, and a Gulfstream intelligence collection airplane went into Syria, bombed the nuclear reactor, but the Syrian air defense system went down for about 20 minutes because of these network attack systems that the Americans had given to the Israelis that we had been using for a long time. And when the Iraqi invasion of 2003 came about, we were using all of these tools again from lessons we had learned when the Israelis had used them in September of 2007. This network attack monitoring hard kill, soft kill methods are really unique to a technologically advanced military like the US, like the Israelis. And if this balloon was stimulating those things to see what would happen, they're kind of doing the same intrusive ISR that we were doing over Iraq and that we would do against the Chinese if we ever went to war down there in the South China Sea, hopefully never go to war against mainland China. My next why question is the path. Obviously, they've launched this thing into the jet stream and they've plotted the jet stream for the next week or so where it was going to take this balloon. I went back and I looked at the launch location of the balloon and it was somewhere in central China. So this thing traveled a long distance. It left Chinese airspace, went up along the Kamchatka Peninsula, across the Aleutians, and then came across Alaska and then turned southeast. Everybody is showing, okay, well, here's the bases in the continental United States that went over, but we're forgetting about Alaska and what is up there. Back in the recesses of my mind, my 65-year-old brain, I thought, wait a minute, we've got like early warning ballistic missile stuff up in Alaska somewhere. Where is that? And I immediately went to ballistic missile early warning radars, Alaska, and of course, an article came right up. And this article wasn't very old. It was 2021. And it was stating that a brand new long range discrimination radar facility had just been built 300 miles north of Anchorage, I think near a little town called Anderson, Alaska. Well, guess what, folks? The path of this balloon went almost right over the top of this brand new long range discrimination radar that we use to monitor ballistic missiles. And it says in the articles about this system, it can also monitor smaller things. So was this long range discrimination radar capable of seeing this balloon and this package that's the size of a regional jet coming up at it? I don't know. But if we're talking the kind of technology that I think we're talking, then it had a pretty good track on it. Now, of course, this begs the question, why didn't we shoot it down over Alaska? General Van Erk actually answered that question in this briefing that he gave. And what he said was, it wasn't bothering anybody. But of course, at this time, we didn't know exactly what it was bothering, but they knew that there was not any kinetics on it, which is good. But the other question I have is, this thing is floating the right altitude for an electromagnetic pulse detonation weapon to go off and just wipe out everything electrical underneath it. I would think that would be enough of a threat. I'm not in one of those command positions, and I'm glad that General Glenn Van Erk, call sign FATS, is. So this thing travels over Alaska, and now if the focal length on a camera on this thing has the area look that I think it has, draw a circle under its flight path centered on its flight path to three to 600 miles in every direction. Because from this altitude, that's about the kind of picture a good high definition, good focal length camera can take pictures of. 
And of course, those pictures are being data linked back to some command center somewhere in China. If it's being data linked back, we can collect on that and we can find out what we call point of origin. Where is it being data linked back to? Let me just spend a few minutes about us, the United States, collecting on this payload. We have the ability to find out through electronic intelligence what its electronic intelligence is looking at. If that package or payload was transmitting, we have the ability and capabilities to exploit that, both uplink and downlink. And what I mean by that, when the Chinese send a message to the payload, we're able to intercept that. If the payload is sending a message back to the Chinese, we are also able to intercept that. And we can do it in quite a broad spectrum, which means we can find out exactly the types of information this thing is sending back to China, whether it be signals intelligence, measurement intelligence, whether it be photographic intelligence, we can find out what it is sending back simply by intercepting those data link signals or whatever kind of signals they are. Even if they're encrypted, we have really good systems that are capable of breaking through all of that encryption and finding out what messages are going up and down from the the balloon to the ground, to the ground, to the balloon, whatever that might be. One of the questions that General Van Erk was asked was, I heard that there was a U-2 spy plane flying around this thing, which the U-2 would, of course, be the ideal platform for collecting any type of intelligence off of this payload. He neither confirm nor deny if a U-2 was being used. But think about it, folks. This balloon is flying between 65,000, 70,000 feet, which is the normal operating range of the U-2 spy plane that has the ability to collect intelligence. But also remember, it has cameras on it too, so it may have taken some really cool pictures of it also. If I were in the decision chain of watching this balloon, then the U-2 and the RC-135 rivet joint would have been two airplanes that that I would have incorporated in the intelligence package to collect on this thing. The U-2 is not irrefutable. Fortunately, the RC-135 is, and as many of you know, a version of the RC-135 does spend a lot of time in Alaska because it monitors ballistic missile tests. That's the Cobra Ball. I'm specifically talking about the rivet joint, which is the battlefield electronic signals and data link intelligence collection aircraft that we and the Brits use for those purposes. And this is the ideal scenario for using that kind of airplane. Now, if you're using the RC-135, you're also using tankers. Ielson Air Force Base, the Alaska Air National Guard is there. They fly KC-135R models. So there were obviously enough assets up there to refuel the RC-135 rivet joint if it was in fact flying missions in and around this balloon over Alaska. As it comes down through Canada, General Van Erk said that they coordinated with the Canadians and his counterpart in Canada as it came down through Canadian airspace doing whatever it was going to do. Then it comes into Montana. Why is Montana important? Because near Great Falls is Malmstrom Air Force Base. Used to be a tanker base, is now a ballistic missile facility. With Comes down through Montana, goes into Wyoming, flies near F.E. Warren Air Force Base. Another strategic ballistic missile facility in the United States Air Force. If there was a camera on the payload, and again, we're talking about 600 mile footprint, then Minot Air Force Base in North Dakota is also under the footprint. That's the big B-52 base. Ellsworth, South Dakota is even closer and is a B-1 Lancer bomber base that has a conventional mission for their B-1s, also has a nuclear mission for their B-1s. Now the thing goes from Wyoming into Kansas. Kansas also has numerous ballistic missile facilities in it, flies near Kansas City. Whiteman Air Force Base is in Knobnoster, Missouri, right outside Kansas City, which is our B-2 bomber base. 
base, our stealth bomber base. Now the balloon keeps on going across Kentucky and Tennessee, also went close to St. Louis, where Transportation Command is and Air Mobility Command. If we were going to deploy anywhere in the Pacific, whether it be in the South China Sea or Taiwan, Air Mobility Command and the 618th Air Operations Center would run that portion of the air campaign. The 618th Air Operations Center at Scott Air Force Base, Transcom or Transportation Command is just right across the street from it. Anything that we deploy to Taiwan, to the South China Sea, anywhere in the Pacific, that is going to be commanded and managed from Scott Air Force Base in Belleville, Illinois. And of course, this balloon, fairly close to it. Now it goes out through Kentucky and Tennessee. Believe that's where our nuclear energy folks live in Tennessee. Now it goes out into North Carolina, South Carolina. You have Seymour Johnson Air Force Base, which is an F-15E Strike Eagle base. And of course, you've got the Marines at uh, Camp Lejeune and also the 20th Fighter Wing, which is at Shaw Air Force Base. The balloon goes basically overhead Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, out to sea, and that's where they shoot it down. But think about all of the strategic U.S. military targets. This thing just flew by on this path across Alaska, through Canada, across the continental United States, and then being blasted out of the air over Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. All of us at some point in time have watched the flights of our family, friends, and loved ones on either Flight Radar 24 or Flight Aware. And this was no different. There are a lot of folks who have taken screenshots of this balloon path and have looked at the ADSB and the squawks of military airplanes that were flying around it. I found it very fascinating that there were three KC-135s from Fairchild Air Force Base that took off, flew east to Montana, and were in the vicinity of this thing, although not up that high. They're in the 19,000, 20,000, 21,000 foot area. And who knows what they were doing, maybe just observing to see what was going on, or they were refueling airplanes that were also watching the balloon. I heard that F-22s and some other aircraft were deployed to Mountain Home Air Force Base and Hill Air Force Air Force Base, which I totally understand. Mountain Home Air Force Base is the home of the 366, the gunfighter wing, and it has F-15E Strike Eagles in it. Those F-15E Strike Eagles have the latest and greatest equipment in them. Used to be an old SAC base, still has the old Strategic Air Command Christmas tree there, but would also be a place where you'd send F-22. So F-22 being a low observable airplane, maybe these tankers from Fairchild were refueling F-22s, F-15E, who knows? When the fighters are doing their thing, they tend to fly with their squawks off. Over the United States, they may have had them on. The F-22s, maybe not. Hard to say. But as this thing traversed across the continental United States, you can kind of see where military airplanes, particularly tankers, were involved in some type of air refueling operations. And of course, during the intercept, there were tankers from, I believe, Alabama and Mississippi that were involved with refueling the F-22s. F-15s, the F-22s that shot it down. Their call sign was Gas Man. Very original. Now let's talk about the actual engagement. On the day of the actual engagement of the balloon, my good friend Scott Brown, with his sweet wife Tracy fairly close to him, called me on the phone and says, hey, are you watching this? And I said, watching what? He says, well, looks like they're going to shoot down this balloon. And I said, oh, really? And he goes, yeah, looks like there's six F-16s from Shaw that are up right now that are flying around the balloon. And then a short time later, he goes, oh, now there's two f 15 from Barnes, the Massachusetts Air Guard that are flying down there. Uh, there's a tanker up also flying. They're, they're showing the ADSB on uh, Fox News and all the airplanes that are flying around it. Now, understand off of the coast of North and South Carolina, we have what we call whiskey areas, which are kind of our playpen. The whiskey areas are the places that we go when we are training and practicing, particularly when we are sharpening dogfighting skills. It gives sterile airspace 
place for those in the fighter world to go out and improve their craft, sharpen their skills. You can't fly through these things unless you get permission and they pretty much stay sterile. So apparently this balloon had floated off into this whiskey, I think 173 location. And now you've got all these airplanes up that are watching it because they know that they're going to get word here pretty soon to shoot this thing down. The tankers are there providing gas, 16s, 15s, F-22s are coming down from Langley. And here's kind of the cool story about the F-22s. We're going to go back to World War One. In World War One, there was the 27th Fighter Squadron that was part of the first pursuit group. The 27th Fighter Squadron was flying SPADs and they had a lieutenant flying in the 27th Fighter Squadron whose name was Frank Luke. He was known as the Arizona Balloon Bust. And during a period of just a couple weeks, he shot down 14 German observation balloons, hence his call sign, the Arizona Balloon Buster. He was from an area near Phoenix. So in order to keep that history going, the 27th Fighter Squadron of the 1st Fighter Wing, the old 1st Pursuit Group, is now at Langley, Virginia. Those F-22s took off with the call sign Frank-01, Frank-02, in honor of Frank Luke, Medal of Honor winner from World War I, the Arizona Balloon Buster, which I think is fantastic. And how they worked that out, I don't know, but I think it's a great, great mark in history that Frank Luke, the World War I Balloon Buster, was taken into combat one more time in 2023 to shoot down this Chinese spy balloon, another observation balloon. Glenn Van Erk said in his press briefing that there was also another F-22 two-ship that was flying and their call sign was Luke 1 and 2. So you had Frank 01, Frank 02, Luke 01, Luke 02 flying during this balloon busting engagement. I love aviation history and I think it's just cool that these call signs were used to memorialize this Congressional Medal of Honor winner, Frank Luke, the Arizona balloon buster. I'll have the link to this on YouTube so that you can listen to it. It goes for 24 minutes. But here is the actual kill order from Huntress, the Northeast Air Defense Sector controller, to Frank and Eagle to go blow that thing out of the sky. So the ground controlled intercept controller on the ground, Northeast Air Defense Sector, that's Huntress. He just told him, hey, kill that thing. Bullseye, 050, 15 miles, 64,000 feet, telling him you can use whatever you want. And then, of course, Frank 01 reads it all back to him. But then comes this interesting part where... Frank 01 is telling his wingman and the two F-15 Eagles, here's our game plan. Frank, object one, 12.2. Frank, two, Frank. And Huntress, 
Just uh, as a reminder from Frank One, we're looking for you to count every single mile. Frank 0102, the F-22s, and Eagle 11, Eagle 12, the F-15s that are from the Massachusetts Air Guard have everything they need now. Game plan, orders to shoot, everything's ready to go. And now they're just waiting for the balloon to be six miles offshore. Remember, it's only 50 feet of water underneath them. So they know exactly where they want this thing to drop. Huntress gives a five-mile call, and here's what happens. And so when you hear Frank 01 go sprint, that means he's going into afterburner to go Mach speed. Remember from his profile, he said, I'm going to do this at Mach 1.3. So when you hear the word sprint, that means he's going into afterburner. That airplane does super cruise like I told you. And uh, now they're sprinting toward the target to their attack heading of 140 with the Eagles about five miles behind them and at a lower altitude than they are. The one last thing they have to do in their cockpit is switch is hot, meaning the Eagles and the Raptors are now master arm on. Missiles, bullets, whatever you want to call it, can come off the airplane. When you're in master arm on, that means everything is alive. And man, when you hear the term arm hot, that sends a cold chill down every fighter pilot's spine. And you can hear the excitement in his voice. Frank one, splash one, TOI one, target of interest number one. And Huntress in a very calm voice goes, copy. This is something that they practice day in, day out. And now they got to do it off of the shore of Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. They probably didn't plan on that, but you can just hear the calmness in their voices until that warhead goes off underneath that balloon. The other thing that I want to mention too is the Eagles from Barnes Air Base up in Massachusetts are carrying sniper targeting pods. Yes, I understand this is an air-to-air airplane. Air-to-air light gray eagles have been carrying these sniper pods for these kinds of things because they can positively ID the target, but more importantly, they can put a laser on it and get range information, altitude information, and also latitude, longitude for whatever drops on the ground or into the ocean. So now the eagles can watch all of the debris come down and with their sniper targeting pods, put the laser on the exact spot they see the splash, get latitude, longitude, elevation, all that good stuff. Do you see all of the things that are happening here? Huntress is talking to them. The Eagles and the Raptors are talking to each other. They're using all of the tools that we have available to shoot down this balloon. And I realize it's a balloon. It's not like another enemy airplane or anything like that. But still, they are defending America's airspace. And I think listening to this is just cool. Well, exactly two minutes later, another player shows up on the ball field, the Navy. And I'm going to let you listen to that right now. Eagle 1, Tiger 9. Eagle 1. Eagle 1, Tiger 9, 158 Alpha, currently Whiskey 137. Request to push uh, north down Whiskey 177. The, uh, remain on top with eyeball. Uh, bad copy from Eagle 1 for that last instruction. Eagle 1 is extending north to get pod footage on the Russian debris. I am masked in my left hand turn. This was a joint event. You just heard Tiger 09, a P-8 Poseidon airplane, probably coming out of Naval Air Station Jacksonville, Florida, that is now on scene and their skill set is this kind of thing. Watching, looking for things on the ocean. The airplane has great sonar capability and it has a really, really good imaging infrared targeting pod like the Reaper drones do. 
has a laser in it, all kinds of good stuff. And that airplane is now going to be on scene. It's at 29,000 feet, but it's going to drop down to 1,500 feet so that it can see where all the pieces are. It can map where all the pieces are with their imaging infrared turret. They can also do what's called synthetic aperture radar. So they'll be able to even see the pieces floating on top of the water. They can also drop stuff into the water, sonar buoys, which will tell them, okay, here's where some of this stuff is as it plops into the water and starts falling down. This is how we fight battles. We do it jointly now. And I think it's just great to listen to this particular audio so that you can hear all these players and all the things that they're doing. And I'll have this in the show notes that you can listen to it too. Oh, one thing I forgot. The P8 says that he's going to drop smoke on the impact point in the water of where this thing falls. The P8 has the ability to drop a smoke canister that floats in the water because they use that when they're hunting submarines, the red or yellow smoke. They can see this smoke for miles away on this imaging infrared turret and watch where it goes and then everybody can spot it because once you put the laser on that thing the sniper pod or or the ph imaging infrared turret then you have the latitude longitude everything that you need and a matter of fact during this conversation it later says that most of the debris is falling in at north 33.35.27 by west 078.41.38. If you want to go out and plot that, more power to you. But that was the primary location that they were talking about in this audio of where all that stuff splashed down. Now, I have not plotted that out yet. I only listened to this just recently. So I thought you'd all get a kick out of hearing that, though. Beginning of this podcast, I mentioned to you that the F-22 Raptor is the beast. It is the fighter plane beast. Arguably, F-35 Lightning guys are saying, oh, no, it's not. But you talk to most people and the airplane that they feel is the absolute beast of fighter planes is, in fact, the F-22 Raptor. Why pick the Raptor? Well, obviously, the historical aspect of this is, of course, huge. 27th Fighter Fighter Squadron, 1st Fighter Wing, Frank Luke, Balloon Buster. 27th Fighter Squadron is now flying the F-22. The F-22 is a huge sensor as well as a shooter. One of the great things about the F-22 is its ability to sense things around it. I remember talking to an F-22 pilot a long time ago who went to the Martin Marietta plant in Georgia to pick a brand new one right off the assembly line. Said it smelled like a new car inside because it's got sheepskin on the ejection seat. One of the things he said to me just kind of in passing was that he took off from Martin Marietta, got up and was passing about 10,000 feet. And he said that on the display, the big situation display between his knees, he could see over 350 different airplanes. Now think about that. That's a lot of airplanes. And of course, Marietta plant, Marietta, Georgia, not too far from Atlanta, Georgia, you know, Hartsfield International Airport. But he was seeing way beyond that. The radar in the F-22 is what we call a low probability of intercept radar because it is an actively electronically scanned array. Each individual little block on this radar screen is its own little individual radar. So you You've got hundreds, maybe even thousands of these little radar screens all working together, either tracking, scanning, or tracking and scanning at the same time. And this track while scan mode is what you use when you're shooting the AIM-120s, the AMRAMs, Advanced Medium Range Air to Air Missile. The F-22 was the perfect airplane for going up and doing this because not only does it have this incredible sensor suite on it, an avionic suite, but it's also got incredible situational awareness that it gives to the pilot. And it has, of course, the AMRAM, Advanced Medium Range Air-to-Air Missile, the AIM-120, and the AIM-9X. 
One other thing that I believe that the F-22 pilots wear now is called the Joint Helmet Mounted Cueing System. Rockwell Collins, the company I used to work for, actually makes this helmet. It truly is a game changer. The first time that the Joint Helmet Mounted Cueing System, or Jehemix as we call it, the nickname for it is The Lid, went into combat, was toward the end of Shock and Awe, and two Super Hornet squadrons were bringing this helmet into combat. VFA-14, the top hatters, and VFA-41, the black aces, bringing this new technology onto the battlefield. What's really fascinating about this helmet is the targeting system is being projected onto the visor. And there's a thing called a target designator box, which, if I'm not mistaken, is in front of the pilot's, his or her right eye. And the cool thing about that helmet is wherever the pilot looks, the sensors and the radars are all also looking. If you overlay that target designator box over something like a tank on the ground or an airplane in the air, you can acquire that. It goes into the weapons computer and that now becomes a target. One of the really cool things about this helmet is also the sensors and seekers in your weapons start looking the same direction. The F-35 does not have a traditional heads up display gun sight the helmet that the f-35 pilots are wearing is the gun sight everything is inside the helmet projected on the visor in front of them and the cool thing about the f-35 helmet is it also has the night vision systems incorporated in it too very expensive helmet very high tech had a lot of teething problems in its infancy but they got them all worked out and it's doing famously now but back to the joint helmet mounted cueing system when you're in an air-to-air dogfight and say you're across the circle turning toward your enemy airplane who is also turning toward you you can look at that airplane put him in that target designator box acquire that target or that airplane and now all of the missile seekers are looking in that direction too one of the really cool things about the aim 9x and again i was a project officer and program manager on the block one and block to aim 9x is that missile will actually come off go across the circle and hit that enemy airplane air-to-air dogfighting is not fair against f-15s f-16s f-15es f-22s f-35s because of this system which brings me to let's talk about the aim 9x for a moment the aim 9x is not really a heat seeking missile per se it's an imaging infrared missile and during some of the tests that we did with this missile, there were some spectacular things that it was able to do. And the other day when I put in AIM-9X on YouTube, some of these videos came up. One of the things that this missile will do is it will actually go behind it. You can actually shoot this missile at something that's behind you. And we tested it. An F-15 shot the missile looking behind him at an F-4, and that's exactly where the missile went. The missile has thrust vectoring system, which gives it even greater maneuverability. And as the missile got closer to the F-4, you were able to discern even panel lines on the F-4 just before the missile hit the drone target. Well, we wanted to see how good this missile really was. Previous models of infrared heat-seeking missiles have a real difficulty discerning and picking out targets that are on the ground because of the different heat signatures that you have have on the ground. And during Vietnam, even later wars, the missile would growl because it would be looking at something on the ground. And of course, they'd launch it and it'd go right into the ground. Not so with the AIM-9X. And just to make sure that this imaging infrared seeker was as good as it was, or we thought it was, we took an F-15 out to China Lake, launched the missile. The target was a truck, old beat up truck that was being pulled on several hundred feet of cable behind another truck at about 35 miles an hour. And sure enough, that missile came off and hit that truck on the hood. Now, the hood had the engine underneath it, but remember, it's being towed. There's no heat coming off of the hood of the truck. It's only residual heat from being out in the sun because the missile seeker also looks at contrast. 
Interesting enough about this missile, the first time it was fired at another enemy aircraft was over Syria. Mob Tremel, the pilot of a F-18 Super Hornet from VFA-87, the war party, saw an Su-22, Syrian Su-22, that had dropped bombs on the Peshmerga or somebody, and he went in to engage the S-22 and shoot it down, this fitter. Well, the AIM-9X missed, and he followed up the AIM-9X shot with an AIM-120C AMRAM, which blew the airplane up. In a matter of fact, Mob Tremel had his infrared targeting pod on the fitter when it hit the fitter, and he followed it all the way down, kind of in a flat spin, all the way down to the ground. Raytheon makes this missile, and Mob Tremel's AIM-9X shot was a couple years ago. So I'm sure they learned whatever lessons they were supposed to learn, and the new Block II missiles that we are now arming our airplanes with are, in fact, finding things like balloons at 65 4,000 feet. When I was assigned to the Operational Test and Evaluation Center at Albuquerque, New Mexico, I mentioned earlier in the podcast, one of my projects was AIM-9X, Block 1 and Block 2. Block 2 was being worked on. AIM-9X had already been put in the field. While stationed at Afotech, I had the opportunity to go talk to the actual program manager of the overall AIM-9X program, and they were in Norfolk. Well, of course, I had moved from Norfolk, Virginia, down to Albuquerque, so I knew the area. Talking to this uh, gentleman on the phone, I said, hey, is there any way we can get like an hour, hour and a half of simulator time in a Super Hornet and uh, allow me to actually shoot a couple of these things at different targets? He goes, yeah, sure, sure, we can do that. I'll uh, I'll set that all up. This was was a backseater and of course we coordinated a lot of stuff over the phone for the different test shots and everything we were doing. Well, time came for me to go up there, spend a week up in Norfolk, which was a lot of fun seeing a lot of my old buds. But sure enough, he scheduled about an hour and 20 minutes in the Super Hornet simulator. And you have to understand, the F-14 squadrons are going away and the F-18s are taking over. So getting an hour and 20 minutes in the Super Hornet simulators was a big deal because they had a lot of training to do at that time. Time period. Well, he let me do a cat shot. We went up and basically were defending the Chesapeake Bay from the Mongol hordes. And what he had done was we never ran out of gas and we never ran out of the AIM-9X. And the simulator instructor just started throwing different scenarios at me. And of course, Biscuit would say, okay, here's what we're going to do. Here's how you do this. Here's how you do that. Here's how you do this. And each of the different scenarios and, and would kind of walk me through as we were doing them, giving me on the job training. He he showed me during one particular scenario the contrast between firing and using the old AIM-9 mics versus the new AIM-9X. And he said, this is the one area where this missile distinctly gives us an advantage. It was a low altitude kind of thing, something moving along the ground, a target moving at low altitude because you have all the ground clutter and all the heat clutter that the AIM-9 mic would not be able to discern, but the AIM-9X would. So three of these scenarios, I got to employ AIM-9X against a target low flying, and it was incredible. He said, okay, let's shoot the mic first. You know, and it's growling and doing all kinds of things, but it missed. Now, he says, Biscuit says, let's try it with an AIM-9X. And man, we skewered that thing cold. It was so different. I couldn't believe it. And I didn't have the helmet on. I didn't have the joint helmet mounted queuing system on. He says, obviously, this would be a lot easier and better if you had the helmet on. Sorry, we don't have that here at the sim, uh, but you get the idea. So for an hour and 20 minutes, actually for an hour, I got to shoot all all kinds of different targets and all kinds of different scenarios with AIM-9X. And I'm telling you, folks, it's an amazing missile. It really is. And the Block II is even more amazing because of other capabilities that they put in it based on some historical models and scenarios and um, lessons learned from some of our coalition partners and some of our allies when employing infrared missiles in different scenarios. It was great to do this. Um, so what did we do the last 20 minutes? We got to do approaches to the carrier, which was a lot of fun. Now, I had been in Norfolk had had an F-14 uh, replacement air group instructor, call sign Wimbo, actually teach me how to land on the carrier. So when it came time to do this, uh, I knew what I was doing. What was 
very fascinating about this was I came in, did an approach, you know, coming down the right side of the ship, 800 feet, three, 400 feet displaced, come into the break, 500 knots, coming around, slow down, come in and I land and I got a three wire, okay, which is what you're supposed to do. Well, canopy comes up, we get out and the instructor that has two new students that are going through the replacement air group in the F-14 F looks at me, sees my patches that I'm a tanker guy. And he goes, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You're a tanker guy and you just caught a three wire on a pass. And I said, yep. <laughs> and he goes, wait, well, stop. I don't know of any tanker guys that can do this. And I told him the story. I said, hey, look, I used to be stationed here. I was teaching at the Joint Forces Staff College. I had a student who told me that in order to keep some semblance of currency, we would go to the F-14 sim because the F-14s were all going away which meant we got a lot of time in the sim. And he taught me how to land. He taught me how to do this, okay? And he looks at his two students and he says, look, if a tanker guy can land, you guys can do it. <laughs> I felt kind of bad walking away, but kind of good at the same time. We didn't just shoot AIM-9X for the whole hour. They still had my security clearances on file there. I couldn't believe it. So I got to do everything that the Super Hornet did so I got to shoot some advanced medium range air to air missiles, AMRAMs, AIM-120s too, at different targets in different scenarios. And again, it was a great learning experience for me to be able to see how these two missiles operated and how good they really were. I've done a lot of research in preparation for this particular episode. And I went back and I did research on this particular balloon and its payload that it carries. And I stumbled across something that really kind of scared me. And that is several articles I read talking about the capabilities of the different payloads they put on these balloons. Now, these balloons have showed up over South America, Guam, Japan, the Philippines, down in the South China see. These have been used in a lot of different places. So the Chinese have a lot of experience with them. But there was one thing that really frightened me about the payload that this balloon was carrying. And that was a video that was from a Chinese TV newscast showing the payload dispensing drones. We have not been able to pick up the majority of the wreckage that sits in 47 to 50 feet of water. Unfortunately, the sea states off of the Carolinas and Myrtle Beach have been too bad and they've not been able to get divers down because obviously it's not down very far. So it's murky, uh, the waves are choppy. It's just not a good situation to be collecting stuff. One of the really scary things that I read about this thing was that it can dispense drones from up to 70,000 feet. And the Chinese newscaster showed video of several drones dropping off of these observation and reconnaissance balloons at 70,000 feet, going down to some altitude, fairly low to the ground. They've got something in them that senses altitude and these drones would come alive and start flying and collecting and taking pictures and doing whatever it is these drones were designed to do. I do not know if there were drones Bones coming off of the payload of this balloon. I'm just saying this has the capability of having these kinds of drones come off of them. In the video, it looked like they were like a normal drone like you'd buy at Best Buy or Walmart. They weren't very big. They're probably not very expensive. And as you know, a lot of folks that fly drones here in the United States, they're made over in China. They've got a lot of experience and expertise with these things. Watching these drones come off of this payload, I was reminded of that scene in the Star Wars movie. You know, launch the Imperial probe droids and they go out throughout the universe uh, collecting whatever it is they're collecting, taking video, signals intelligence, electronic intelligence, and who knows, folks, until we get this thing off the floor of the ocean, if this particular payload had that capability or not. And as you can imagine from 60 to 70,000 feet, these drones have a lot of coverage. That's why I said, you know, a 600 mile footprint under the actual flight path is probably pretty realistic. And I've heard up to 1200 miles, 600 miles in every direction. 
I'm using 600 as I'm talking about this. These drones dropping from 70,000 feet, you can imagine they've got a pretty good size footprint because they're just free falling down and they get to some point and turn their little brains on and their propellers and do what they need to do. <clears throat> now, I don't know if these drones have been found anywhere around any of the locations that I talked about up in Alaska, Malmstrom, F.E. Warren. I'm just saying that these balloons that the Chinese are floating all these countries have the capability of the payload, reconnaissance payload, expending drones and those Imperial probe droids going off and doing their thing too. Wouldn't that be something if we find out that in fact they could launch drones from this thing and they came down and started stimulating the 5G network on some of these cell phone towers? Because that was one comment one of my friends made to me like, hey, what if this thing was using our own cell towers? And folks, I don't know, but that's not outside the realm of possibility because we have to look at all of the electronic signals coming off of this thing. We have to look at all the electronic signals, not only being radiated from this thing, but also what it was collecting too. All of our cell phones, particularly if you have an iPhone, if you have an iPhone or an iPad or a MacBook Pro, remember where they're all made. And I realize some of you are saying out there, well, you're such a conspiracy theorist. But it's a question we've got to ask, okay? And now I'll be honest with you, when people say I'm a conspiracy theorist, I kind of take that as a compliment because it means at least I'm asking the right questions. There's one more YouTube video I'm gonna play for you. And again, both of these will be in the show notes so that you can go see them yourself. We're only six miles offshore of Myrtle Beach. Everybody has seen this balloon and now they've seen all the contrails of all the fighter jets flying around and they know something's going to happen. The actual shoot down comes at 2.39 Eastern time. So it's early afternoon. It's extremely clear. You can see for 60, 70 miles and everybody's got their phone out. A lot of people are videotaping this and I found one that's really good. Somebody in the Myrtle Beach area, it sounds like four people, and they're watching this whole engagement, but they're also hearing it. And so what I want to do now is play that audio for you just real quick. Oh, yeah. Here we go, baby. They see the missile come off. And they see the balloon blow up. I just heard the boom. She heard the airplane go on Mach 1.3. She heard the sonic boom. Yeah, you see shiny stuff. The shiny stuff she sees coming down, obviously, is the payload. I see shiny stuff. And the solar panels. And in the video, you can see the F-22 making his left-hand turn to come off to the north. See, and this guy knows his lingo. He said, splash, splash. Isn't that amazing? And they continue watching this uh, balloon come down and all the pieces come down. And the rocket motor contrail is starting to get broken up in the wind up at altitude. See, and the lady confirms. I heard the boom. I heard the boom. She heard the F-22 going supersonic. And very indistinctly, and I don't know if you heard it, you could actually hear the warhead go off. Of course, it's delayed because they're up at 50, 58,000 feet. But you could still hear the boom fairly loud when the F-22 goes supersonic. And you can still hear the warhead go off blow up the balloon. And that's when the pilot, Frank01, says, K kill, kinetic kill. Warhead's gone off. Balloon is completely destroyed. Everything's fallen to the ground. The other thing that I really liked was the excitement in this guy's voice. There we go, baby. Get it. Get it. <laughs> and you know what? 
<laughs> the really odd thing about that is I bet you that F-22 pilot was thinking the same exact words when he saw that missile come off the rail, saw the smoke of the rocket motor, and off it went. I bet you he was probably thinking the same thing. Get it, baby! Get it, baby! And in this particular video, you can see the AIM-9X come off of the F-22. The F-22 is making its contrail, but the AIM-9X missile has its rocket motor trail, and it only lasts for a couple seconds. And then, of course, the missile's on its own and it's doing its thing. But all of this is in that video. And the excitement of shooting this thing down, the pilots share that same excitement as these people on the ground. And if you go look at some of these other videos that people took of the actual engagement, they're very excited to watch this thing. The history of Frank Zero One and the call signs that they used all go back to World War I and the great balloon buster, Lieutenant Frank Luke from Phoenix, Arizona, the 27th Fighter Squadron, which these F-22s are from. Now, the thing that I want to really see is how do they mark this destruction of this balloon on the F-22? I've seen several pictures of the F-22 Frank Zero One. It was actually the squadron flagship because it had 27th FS on the tail. I'm hoping that's the truth. I don't know. But there was a gentleman that was actually at the fence at Langley, and he has video of the two F-22s taxiing to the end of the runway and getting ready to depart from the base. The music that I use on the Lessons from the Cockpit show is called On to the Next One by Bobo Renthal. He lives down in Southeast Asia. So let's go on to the next one. As you all know, Sunday they had another shoot down, and guess what? Now there's audio from that one. And I have that. And I've been able to go through that audio. And I there's a couple of things I want to play for you because it's so fascinating. They're trying to describe what they're seeing. They've got all of the same stuff that the F-15s, when they shot down the balloon, have. And they're looking at it through the pod. They're also trying to get missile tone on it. But they can't. They say it's intermittent. So there's a couple spots in the audio from the Lake Huron shoot down with the Wisconsin F-16s that I want to play for you. And so these F-16s have all the latest toys on them because these were uh, weasels. These are the weasel F-16s that are now up at Duluth. So let me play a few things here for you that I think I found interesting. The call sign of the F-16s is Acer-11. I'm not sure how to spell that. I'm thinking A-C-E-R-11 and 12. And they just said, we're going to yo-yo to the tanker. So what that means is the tanker is going to be close to the actual engagement. And they're just going to flow on and off the tanker. We call it staying on the nipple. Always keeping the fighters full of gas, particularly in this situation, because the situation is still unfolding. They're going to figure out their game plan while they're still looking at whatever this object is. And now they see the object and they start describing it. Outside is kind of like a blackish, similar 
So he's describing it as like a dark object. It's octagonal. It's about the size of a car and it has strings hanging down from it. So the first time they go by it and VID it, this is what they see. A few moments later, they go by it again and describe it one more time to Huntress. Northeast Air Defense Sector folks, they're taking care of this. Their ground control intercept folks are the ones they're talking to during this whole engagement. So they make this second pass over the top of it and they're still describing it as this dark object. It's obviously metal because sun's glinting off of it, strings hanging down, and they don't know what it is. They call it a balloon, but it's octagonal. So they go in and Huntress gives them permission to go ahead and shoot the thing. Well, they shoot it with an AIM-9X, the same thing they did the balloon off of Myrtle Beach, and it misses. That missile does not make contact with the object. They come around, shoot a second AIM-9 at it, which, after shooting the thing down, they use kind of a weird word. They said it was decommissioned. Not destroyed, not taken out, but decommissioned. That is really a weird word to use in a situation like this. And I found it interesting that the Pittsburgh Guard tanker had a similar call sign as the one that was floating off of Myrtle Beach, Gas Man. The AWACS that was kind of directing traffic for this one was called Sentry 25. And that's pretty common for the E3s coming out of uh, Tinker Air Force Base. They always use the term Sentry. That's what the airplane's name is, Sentry. So I can understand why Sentry 25 was used. Well, now that they've done this, of course, the DOD has to put out a message to everybody saying, okay, well, here's what we did. And this is what that message says. Today at 2.42 p.m. at the direction of President Biden and based on the recommendations of Secretary Austin, the military leadership, an F-16 fired an AIM-9X to successfully shoot down an airborne object flying at approximately 20,000 feet altitude in U.S. airspace over Lake Huron in the state of Michigan. Its path and altitude raised concerns, including that it could be a hazard to civilian aviation. The location chosen for this shoot down afforded us the opportunity to avoid impact to people on the ground while improving chances for debris recovery. There are no indications of any civilians hurt or otherwise affected. North American Aerospace Defense Command detected the object Sunday morning and has maintained visual and radar track of it. Based on its flight path and data, we can reasonably connect this object to the radar signal picked up over Montana, which flew in proximity to sensitive DOD sites. We did not assess it to be a kinetic military threat or anything on the ground, but assess it was a safety flight hazard and a threat due to its potential surveillance capabilities. Our team will now work to recover the object in an effort to learn more. And this is one of the things I want you to also understand. Maybe we're being conditioned and we call it conditioning. One of the things that we did in the Iraqi air campaign is we'd have all these airplanes, you know, jamming up against the Iraqi border we do it four or five, six times. Well, by the seventh or eighth, ninth time, the Iraqis are going, oh yeah, okay, we've seen this before. And then on the 10th time, we come across and start bombing things. And we called it conditioning. Are we being conditioned for something here? That's just a question I have. And a lot of my friends are asking. So the Lake Huron shoot down is a metal object. It's shiny. It's dark metal, has strings hanging off of it, flying around 20,000 feet. First AIM 9X misses. Second, one gets it dead. Now comes all of the after action debriefing and finding out what capabilities does this payload package have and what did we learn from this? Here's some of the things that I'd be asking. Obviously, this is a surveillance balloon. General Van Erk said at the beginning, they knew that this was some kind of surveillance balloon. We've seen them before. We've also missed a couple of them. 
And he mentioned that there are awareness gaps, as he called them, meaning there is some space that we are not able to discern what is going through it. So there is a capability gap that we have there with something like a balloon carrying a package that is as big as a regional jet. That's a little disconcerting. Other things that we learned from this, what does this payload do? Does it collect electronic intelligence? Does it collect signals intelligence? Is it measuring things that are going on around it? Was it able to measure uh, cell phone frequencies? Was it able to monitor cell phones, data? The next thing is what did it collect from all of these bases it flew over? General Van Erk in his testimony said, we knew where the thing was going and we took measures to cover up things on the different places it was going over. I have no idea what those deception means were. Uh, I wouldn't put those in here anyway if we if I did, but they had to cover up certain things to keep them hid from this balloon. It could have been photographic. It could have been signals. It could have been electronic. It could have been measurement. It could have been a number of things that they had to cover up as this balloon was going over. What did we learn about the intercept? If we're going to see more of these balloons, then obviously we've got to write all of these tactics, techniques, and procedures down. A balloon is not that big a deal. And a matter of fact, the administration said yesterday, hey, this thing going over the United States wasn't that big a deal. Well, to us military guys, it kind of was because we realized what it was. But these balloons now present a different type of target set that we frankly haven't engaged. Now we have. They use this imaging infrared AIM-9X against the balloon. It has a smaller warhead. It means it's the warhead's not going to have a big blast radius like the AIM-9X. AIM-120 AMRAAM, which is another reason why they use this uh, particular inf imaging infrared missile, because the blast fragmentation warhead on it doesn't have that big of a footprint. The AIM-120, it's big. And it's an incredible missile too. And there are certain areas where if this missile gets that close to you, you won't be able to escape it. The other thing too is, were we able to jam this thing so that it was not being able to talk back to wherever its command and control unit was? Did this balloon have some type of propellant or some way of changing course? Because a lot of people said, oh, this thing changed course. Other thing that would be really fascinating to find out out, is what did Space and Cyber Command find out when this thing was either radiating, talking to whoever it was talking to, and what were they able to collect on this? Now, why did we let the balloon go all the way across Alaska and the United States? I don't know. General Van Erk said he did not feel that it was going to injure anybody. The only injury would come if they shot the thing down and had pieces falling down upon them, particularly when he mentioned that this thing weighed a couple thousand pounds. Obviously, you don't want to drop that on certain populated areas. But hey, it's going over Alaska, Montana, Wyoming. There's a, a lot of space over Kansas. They could have brought this thing down. And I'm sure there are going to be House and Senate investigation into this balloon, what it might have collected, and why did we wait so long to shoot this thing down? And I think the last thing we have to realize is this ain't going to be the first time. We found out that there were three balloons that they didn't see. This one you could see even with the naked eye because it was pretty good size, 200 feet tall. We will see these going over other areas of the United States, probably following the jet stream. So be prepared to see other types of balloons like this. And again, the two scariest scenarios from this balloon, in my opinion, are hanging an EMP type of device on the bottom of this electromagnetic pulse going off over the midsection of the United States like Kansas City or thousands of little micro drones in a swarm being dropped out of this thing from some height where they can go 600 miles, 1200 miles in any direction from 70,000 feet. That's the scary scenario. Thanks for listening into this episode of the Lessons from the Cockpit show. Episode number 54 is in 
the tank. I appreciate all of you coming by and listening. And I realize there is a lot of information here and there's a lot of spooky things that are going on. I am just trying to tell you this is what's going on in the aviation, which includes space world right now. This episode is brought to you by Wall Pilot, custom aviation art for the walls of your home, office, or hangar. Go by wallpilot.com and order one or two of our 127 ready to print vinyl graphics that you can peel off and stick to any wall in your home office or hangar. The wall pilot has everything from World War II, working on World War I, working on two helicopters, which I know nothing about. Please go by Wall Pilot, order one or two of these. That's what keeps this show going. If you have a favorite airplane, we can put your name, tail number, weapons load on that airplane and send it to you. This and previous episodes of the Lessons from the Cockpit show can be found on my website at markhasera.com under the podcast pull down box. I can't thank you enough, folks, for going by and listening to the podcast. Our viewership is going up pretty quickly because I'm getting a lot of people on my Lieutenant Colonel Marcus Sarah TikTok page. I'm going to reserve the right for what next week's podcast is going to be about because, folks, who knows what's going to happen? Who knows if there's going to be more shoot downs, more aviation history being made, more things in the news. So we'll wait and see what happens through the week. Thanks again for downloading Lessons from the Cockpit podcast. And I so appreciate all of you tuning in and listening. Go by Wall Pilot. Take a look at some of our ready to print uh, profiles that you can stick on your walls or order a custom one. Thanks again, folks. Talk to you next week.